Okay, I think we will start the program now. Uh, namaste and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the sixth episode of the Wild and Life Seminar Series hosted by the Small Mammals Conservation and Research Foundation, SMCRF Kathmandu, Nepal. And I'm Varsha Rai, your regular host. Uh, in the series, we have been inviting different experts to talk about their works in the field of biodiversity research and conservation. Uh, and today we have Mr. Rinzin Funzo Klama, who is the conservation program director and conservation biologist at the Third Pole Conservancy, an NGO established to promote science-based conservation of wildlife and its habitat in Nepal Himalaya. He's also an executive member of the Nepal-based NGO Mountain Spirit. Mr. Dharma has been actively involved in research and conservation of high altitude wildlife in Nepal since 2014, with many peer reviewed articles to his credit. In 2015, he was awarded with Wildlife Conservation Network scholarship to pursue his master's degree in international nature uh, conservation for the, from the University of Göttingen, Germany and Lincoln University, New Zealand. He's also the recipient of WWF Nepal Conservation Award in 2020, recognizing his significant contributions to protect Nepal's rich biodiversity. Recently, he's also been awarded with the prestigious Rolex Award for Enterprise 2021 in recognition of his effort for biodiversity conservation in Nepal's Trans Himalaya. And for your information, he is the first Nepali to receive this award. So now I would like to welcome Mr. Rinzin Lama for his presentation. The title of his talk will be Conservation of Snow Leopards in Nepal's Trans Himalaya. And before moving on to the session, I would also like to notify everybody that the session is being broadcasted live on official Facebook page of SMCRF. The session is also being recorded, which you can find later in our YouTube channel. Uh, and also please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box in Zoom. You can also put your questions in the comment section if you're watching us live from Facebook and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, so without further delay, I would like to uh, hand over uh, the space to Mr. Lama. So over to you, Mr. Lama. Thank you so much, uh, Barsaji. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's a great pleasure and I'm very happy to be here to share about uh, the conservation work that we have been doing over the years in Nepal, Himalay. Uh, today, I'm not gonna present lots of data. I think, you know, like uh, this is sometimes really boring. So basically I will focus on what kind of work or what activities we have been focusing on protecting mine, mountain biodiversity with a focus on this small leopard. So I'm going to show some puzzle as an energizer first, you know, so that we just bring some energy. Uh, I think, uh, you know, like I could ask, but here I'm going to show how we walk out in the field, you know. There is a snow leopard somewhere. Uh, I don't know many people might be able to see or not. So this is one of the random sort that my field colleague, Tasia Gale, you know, he, he was just taking a random picture and all of a sudden, you know, there was a snow leopard discovered. There are more. There's a big horde of blue sheep. Again, the same thing. So the context that I was trying to show this picture is mountain, the mountain areas of Nepal is not just remote. It's not just a difficult in terms of terrain, uh, but the species that we're working on, especially snow leopard and blue sheep, uh, they are so well camouflaged uh, with this uh, landscape and it's so hard to spot them. And that is why one of the reasons, you know, it's really difficult to study their ecology and behavior. About my engagement in the field of wildlife conservation, uh, I started studying uh, wildlife uh, when I was in the final year of my BSc forestry. And I started uh, uh, studying highland mammals, uh, particularly I started with this tiny here, it's called pika. I was studying the species identification of the pika in on conservation area using uh, uh, genetic uh, tools and then collecting the pellet or poop of the pika uh, to extract DNA and see you know, what Hello, Ringin sir. Hello. Yeah, do you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, 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 okay. 
So here is a picture of the palace cat. Mm, uh, my colleague Tasiar Gale discovered this cat back in 2014. First, this was photographed in the fall of 2012, but later again, he photographed in 13 and in 14. And later this cat was identified as a new cat species to Nepal. So we were basically start, we were starting our work, uh, more organized work on high mountain wildlife with this palace cat. Uh, I think we are one of the first team uh, doing extensive uh, camera trapping survey of this cat to study about its behavior, population status, threats, and somehow ecology in Manang area, Wanapuna conservation area. And after that, uh, here's come the snow leopard. This is the first picture of the snow leopard from Humla, uh, the camera trap picture of the snow leopard. The snow leopard were photographed in Humla before, but uh, this was the first camera trap. Uh, as we were studying palace cat, we had the opportunity to study snow leopard quite intensively in Manang area. And we, we, we did a very intensive camera trapping from 2014 through 2018 in Manang region of Onokuna conservation area. That is where we are uh, learning lots of field biology uh, with more focus on field, field activities and visiting field and trying to study the behavior of the palace cat. But later it was more focused on snow leopard. And with a funding support from uh, NEF and Snow Leopard Networks grant, we are doing a Snow Leopard survey in Humla. Uh, and this was, uh, this was the picture we photographed. So during that survey, we recorded a Snow Leopard in three locations. And we estimated the population size of uh, three individuals per 100 square kilometer for a very effective area in Limi, which covers around uh, 400 square kilometer. So as coming back to snow leopard, this is how I started my wildlife journey and now you know, stepping more into the snow leopard. Uh, as uh, many of us know, snow leopard is globally threatened. Uh, right now it's listed at Borna level in the IUCN red list of threatened species, and it is listed in CITES Appendix X. The recent uh, GCLIP Global Snow Leopard Ecosystem uh, Conservation Program has estimated the number between 4,000 to uh, 6,000 plus randomly. Uh, this is the global distribution of the snow leopard. You know, like it is distributed in triple range countries with a possible occurrence in Myanmar, but uh, so far it's not recorded. This is the potential distribution map of the snow leopard in Nepal. It's based on Aral Idol 2016. So in Nepal, snow leopards are distributed uh, over the area of 17,190 square kilometer with a population, estimated population size of 300 to 400 individuals. However, uh, this is the estimated number. We don't know how many small leopards we have in Nepal. And right now, government is uh, preparing on uh, in assessing the nationwide population status of small leopard. So these are the two primary areas in Nepal where we are focusing our hope. Uh, so far, we have been focusing more of our uh, research and conservation activities in Annapurna conservation area. But from this year, uh, with uh, Rolex, Award for Enterprise Funding, we're extending uh, more on community-based uh, biodiversity conservation with a focus on the snow leopard in Umla as well. I'm going to show some of the landscape uh, that snow leopard inhabits. So this is Palum Valley from Upper Humla, Limi Valley. These are some of the rugged landscape from Upper Mustang. Again, this is from Upper Mustang. So looking at this landscape, uh, I didn't show many of the mountain picture out here because, uh, you know, like the upper part of the Annapurna Arna, conservation area is very dry, and this is where we have been focusing our work uh, more recently. So you, you can imagine, you know, starting in this dry landscape is not easy, uh, and monitoring or solving small leopard is something really challenging. But uh, we are, you know, still we are trying our best in assessing or in bringing out some. Uh, monitoring assessment, monitoring baseline using camera traffic and science survey. One of the reasons why do we need to protect snow leopard? Uh, the biggest question is, you know, why is snow leopard need to be protected? Why should we focus on this? Uh, you know, it's not just about uh, threatened species. It's not about just about uh, rare species. But there are lots more things going on the ground. You know, uh, like the things like habitat loss and fragmentation. Prey-based decline is one of the key issues, especially in the area outside the protected area. Uh, Subsistence and hunting is a very big issue, which is really difficult to monitor and which is very difficult to minimize. That is something, a challenge we have. Uh, in, in addition to that, you want a small leopard conflict is perhaps one of the most direct form of conflict uh, between the local holders and the small leopard. You know, we often 
results in a retaliatory killing. Uh, and this kind of challenge we have that we have to mitigate for the long-term survival of a small leopard. In uh, again, like uh, the lack of education and awareness among the herding communities uh, in a bigger area, uh, climate change impact on the small leopard habitat, uh, wildlife diseases, particularly food and mouth disease on small leopard spray and other dimension of wildlife disease which are least studied so far and this need to be explored and there are a range of challenges we are hindering the uh, organized or institutionalized effort on eastern leopard conservation so one of the very common example like uh, you know over the years uh, one of our main focus has been mitigating human snow leopard conflict uh, because uh, snow leopards habitat and livestock grazing area often overlap each other and one of the immediate outcome is the loss of livestock. It's not about kills livestock and that is where all the problem starts. And, and mitigating this uh, such problem is very important uh, to ensure the future of a snow leopard because up high in the mountains where there are no government presence or where only herders community live, uh, you know, like the or train or the number of snow leopard being killed as a retributory in retribution such kind of uh, incidences are really difficult to monitor. That is why uh, educating and supporting or, uh, or supporting holders in mitigating snow leopard in human snow leopard conflict is of great importance so that these communities uh, have tolerance towards snow leopard and other carnivores. Now, this is one of the pictures from Manan. So with these needs, you know, what had been our, our approach to snow leopard conservation? We have been focusing on research, of course, you know, the correct uh, assessment of any kind of problem or assessment of the biodiversity as a baseline information is very important to establish that so that we have a monitoring uh, indicators through which we align our efforts. And one of the focuses uh, research on snow leopard, uh, snow leopard status, their distribution, previous status, uh, conflict, uh, conservation needs, and all these things. And, in case of snow leopards, since snow leopard is very difficult to see in the wild. You know, their sightings are really rare. That is why we have to rely on their signs uh, for most of the ecological study. Uh, in addition to the sign, we also rely on camera tapping quite a lot. So we follow on different snow leopard signs, such as oak marks, scarves, scats. We follow on to presence, absence survey, and all the status studies. And with these days, I think uh, camera trap have been very supportive. It's one of the very powerful tools in wildlife studies. With the use of camera trap, and lots of new things are being uh, discovered, you know, which were not easily uh, visible before, which were not that documented before. For example, as we started the use of camera trap in Manan intensively, uh, we figured out quite lots of things uh, apart from the target species that we want to study. For example, most of our camera were for monitoring either Palaska or Snow Leopard. But apart from that, we also get quite lots of new information, you know, which is very exciting. And previous monitoring is, of course, one of the key things in uh, snow leopard study, assessing the status of wild prey, uh, all these things. And the other important things we have been doing over the years is a regular uh, monitoring of the depredation records, you know, how the conflict is going on, uh, what is the depredation patterns looks like. So this is something we have been uh, following regularly since 2015 in Manan. And the other thing is, you know, trying to bring out based on these uh, field results, uh, mostly camera trapping, field visit, interviews, uh, science survey, we try to present our finding as much as possible uh, so that, you know, we share our finding with the greater scientific communities. So publication is, of course, one of the priority, but this is not going to help conservation, but it's also important to inform scientific communities that, you know, what have been the outcome of our, what is the outcome of our result and what the, uh, and our different approaches on that. On the community part, uh, education and awareness, uh, capacity building has been one of the key focus of our work, uh, either in Humla or Manang. In Manang, we have been practicing that quite intensively. Uh, right now, we have extended to Upper Mustang and Humla, Humla definitely. So we are focusing on capacity build-up of the uh, rural municipality members, uh, school children, uh, interested local youths, you know, whom we can promote as a future citizen scientist. So these are some of the activities we, we have been doing it regularly. 
So in the picture of this are the school children from uh, Annapurna Higher Secondary School in Manan. And every year we do a program called Snow Leopard Scout. Uh, it's a three-day program. Uh, half of the time we provide them in class, uh, in class, we engage them in class activities uh, where we teach them theories, presentations, you know, documentaries, and then we take out them in the field to have the field exposure and show them the Snow Leopard sign and the basic field survey techniques. We have been doing that, uh, I think, like since 2016 on a regular basis. So this is a workshop, you know, participatory workshop and you know, conservation needs, prioritization, conservation issues, uh, all of these things. So this is from Umla. And one of the key things, as I mentioned before, one of the key things in snow leopard conservation is mitigating human snow leopard conflict. Because uh, when the herders are not, you know, when, when, the, con when the conflict is uh, recurring and when the herders are not addressed, this becomes very critical, not just for snow leopard, for other, other wild events also. That's where mitigating human snow leopard conflict is very important uh, uh, to win the goodwill of the herder communities or to increase their participation and to increase their tolerance towards these predators. That's one of the reasons. So we have been supporting predator group coral uh, to the herders in Manang and Upper Mustang. So this is the iron mesh predator proof coral. The height is quite high. I think it's around eight feet tall so that the snow leopard cannot jump in. The other things we have been piloting in Manang is in Annapurna conservation area in Manang more. And right now we are extending it to Upper Mustang is a fox light. So fox light is a lighting device. It has a solar at the top uh, during the daytime, you know, from the sun, the battery gets charged. And as soon as it gets dark, it started emitting out different high pitch rays, uh, white color, blue color light, so that up in the mountain where there are no human settlement, and when the predators see this kind of unusual light, they tend to avoid this kind of area. So we put this light in, uh, in close proximity to the livestock cells, you know, close to the livestock tent like this. And the other thing we have, you know, like the gear to the hotels, uh, waterproof jackets and uh, high range monitoring light for nighttime. If there is something unusual happening, people can use that torch light to monitor whether the predator is coming closer or not. It's not a very big support, but this is somehow very handy. It's a very useful tool for the hotels in the mountain. And establishing conservation holding boards you know for the education for the awareness purpose uh, i think this is something we, we use in humla not writing lots of messages but like i mentioning only a few lines from our spiritual report say, you know his appeal for conservation and this has been quite effective you know lots uh, you know, the board are well take you know like people take care of the board you know, and then people visibility has also in case when they see the big spiritual llama in the board people come and try to read those lines, whatever is there. So I think this was one of the good approaches that uh, we use in Humla. Apart from the research, uh, and, uh, all this uh, conservation intervention uh, with the mountain studies, uh, we have a set of challenges. I think not just only in mountain spaces, but overall wildlife, but in the mountain, because of the logistics, there are sets of different issues. You know, maybe Norris Tai knows it better. I saw his name somewhere. He's, I think he's also listening here. So there are challenges, uh, there are outcomes. And apart from that, we still have time to celebrate some of the achievements. You know, when we work so hard in the mountains, there are lots of uh, exciting uh, achievements that we, you know, that really gives pleasure. So this is the picture of uh, picture of our team in Manang uh, back in winter of December 2000. I think it's in December 20 to 2014. So when we were doing the camera trapping uh, survey, the snowfall was so heavy that year. And then every two to three days, we have to go up and clean our camera so that the camera is not covered on the snow and it's smoking. And then uh, I think it was around the end of the December uh, when we were checking some of the earliest camera traps, we found uh, the, the, like, I think this was the first uh, photo of the palace cat that our survey recorded. So we are so exciting to share that movement. You could feel that as well in the picture. <laughs> so this was the first picture that we recorded during our 2014 survey. 
while starting Talaskar and while starting Istmo Leopard, there are side achievements, as I mentioned before. You know, this this is the this is the manual picture of Himalayan wolf. So wolf were locally extinct from Monang region uh, more than four decades ago. And uh, back in 2015, I think it was in May 2015, we recorded the first uh, picture of the wolf during nighttime. And it was so hard to difficult, it was so hard to identify the species, whether it was wolf or not, you know, like we were not sure. So we dropped that out. And later again in 2000, I, I, I think the end of the same year, we recorded the wolf, we, we had the daytime record of the wolf and that was the first time we recorded wolf, we confirmed the returns of the wolf to Manang Valley. The, this is the first manual photograph of the wolf in Manang. And this is the leopard cat. I think, uh, you know, in Manang, uh, many people have seen leopard cat, but there were no uh, photographic evidence. Uh, and we managed to photograph this. Tashi Daif managed to photograph this in Kangsar village of Manang. And again, uh, the yellow throated martin, you know, in upper, like this was photographed in Braga area. I think this was one of the very rare photo of the yellow throated martin from upper Manang region. This is a Tibetan Patris. Uh, even in Manang, uh, we, when we were interviewing with old holders, uh, they don't remember, uh, they, they don't remember seeing this bird for a long time. So Tashidai says, like, I think like this boss has recolonized uh, in Manang area after quite a long time back. So this is one of the manual picture of the bird. It's the, I will just show more of the picture, you know, just try to uh, show what we have. I think uh, this is the family picture of this knowledge about mother and her two calves. If you look at the landscape, it's so well camouflaged, you know, like these are extremely difficult to see actually, but Tashidai was lucky enough to side, the, side them. These are more picture of this small leopard. In Manang, we had around 20, 24 camera trapping location and every week we have a small leopard picture coming up. That was something very exciting. Yeah, without these camera traps, you know, we will never be able to study these kind of behaviors of this pond of bird. And that, that is the power of the technology, you know, like we are, as I mentioned before, we are trying to study the field biology of the small leopard, the marking behavior, the mating behavior, cop survival, and habitat use pattern very intensively in Manang areas. And, and the camera trap was very helpful in that direction. This is the picture of the Tibetan Kang from Limi. Limi Valley of Puma. It's a smaller person main prey blue sheep, Molan vulture. And this is one of the fun thing, uh, Beast Martin. Uh, one of the uh, Beast Martin, you know, is quite hard to sight during the daytime, but uh, this is also one of the major small carnivore that is quite often photographed in our camera trap. So it's visiting camera trap quite frequently. This is the manual photograph of a uh, mountain weasel catching bull. I think this is a royal bull. Malayan marmot from Limi, Humla. This is the picture of Tibetan orgali from Humla. I think orgali is also one of the quite rare species. So apart from all these achievements, all this uh, excitement, there are sets of challenges that we feel in wildlife studies. And one of the most uh, common challenges of in the mountain is uh, terrain, you know. When the weather is not good, when the visibility is not very good, uh, we often <clears throat> we often fail to, what you call, figure out the exact trial in that case, uh, you know, like getting the orientation of the right track is, is something very challenging. The other thing is uh, weather is not always favorable, you know. Like right now in the morning, it's very clear, uh, weather is very good, but in the afternoon, all of a sudden, there can be snowfall or there can be rain, uh, more commonly snowfall. And, and during when we are doing the winter surveys, especially with the heavy snowfall, it's quite, uh, it's quite, you know, it's very uh, labor intensive or it's quite challenging tasks to 
keep the camera monitoring and keep it functional, remove the snow out and all these things. Uh, you can see that, you know, the snowfall get that deep and we have to clean it uh, every two, three days to keep the camera functional. And this is something very common. Monan is a, it's supposed to be a very rain shadow area, but uh, even in the late, even in early autumn, the weather is uh, very unpredictable. All of a sudden the fox comes, all of a sudden the rain comes. So, and then that is what reduces our vulnerability and it, it's, it's always a big struggle to figure out the right track. The other issue with the mountain space is logistic. Logistic is always very challenging and all logistic is quite expensive. You know, we have to carry everything with us uh, on mules and, uh, you know, we have to rely on the camping. Uh, so when we are out in the long field, for example, for a month and two months, we have to make sure that we have enough uh, logistic materials, enough food uh, and other materials to, so that we can continue research until that time period. And in many areas, uh, you know, we, sometimes it's also difficult to hear, uh, right here, the forest is clubized, but when in the high altitude area where there are no trees or so, uh, like cooking is also one of the issues. That is how, like, you know, sometimes we have to carry the fuel by ourselves. So that was uh, something we have done in the past with a very brief overview of, you know, the work we have been doing. Uh, right now, we have two projects going on. I will just uh, share a very brief about the two work, uh, very intensive work that we are, we are doing, uh, which are based on our past uh, project and past research activities. Right now in Annapurna Conservation Area, we have a human snow leopard coexistence project. It's basically focusing on um, relationship, ecological, uh, you know, identifying the ecological causes of livestock depredation by snow leopard. And, and, and try to design effective mitigation measures. And the key objective of the project was to reveal how the loss of the wild prey affect livestock depredation by snow leopard. So we have a livestock data from the household survey and field survey, and we have the prey survey. Uh, basically, we account only blue sheep, blue sheep survey. And we are trying to link you know, how the relationship between the wild prey and livestock is affecting snow leopard depredation. The other thing is, uh, so far we have been piloting lots of mitigation measures in Annapurna conservation area. For example, a predator-proof corral, uh, fox light, you know, uh, and then we are trying to uh, study the effectiveness of this kind of devices in reducing nighttime degradation of this uh, small report. So this is one of the projects I think is, is going in collaboration with the University of Gottingen, Germany. We, we have almost completed, uh, we, uh, we are almost at the end of this project and right now we are in the data analysis phase. And the most uh, exciting and project is, uh, this is the project that uh, I received Rolex award for. So it's, uh, it's, it's focuses on, you know, uh, biodiversity documentation and monitoring uh, based on community, uh, using community resources. Uh, uh, and this project is more focused on upper Canary landscape. Uh, it will cover Humla, Humla. Uh, the, most of the conservation work is focused in Humla, but uh, we are planning to cover the resource, you know, the snow leopard and prey survey will be conducted uh, along the upper Canary landscape from uh, Humla Bajura border to uh, Karmurong Valley in Mugu district. So we are trying to cover a big landscape in this part. The, this work focus on the ecology of the snow leopard, uh, not just uh, status and distribution, we are, we are uh, looking at the dietary analysis, you know, the determining the snow leopard population using camera trap and genetics, uh, genetic analysis. Uh, we are determining the prey status, uh, studying human snow leopard conflict uh, and, and distribution mapping. Of course, uh, this is one of the purpose of uh, making distribution map is to determine the, uh, you know, connectivity and uh, conservation what do you call it? conservation zone prioritization, one of the focus is that. And the ultimate goal of this project uh, is uh, to support local government and related stakeholders such as government in preparation of the local conservation uh, plan. Uh, and right now uh, I'm in conversation with the Department of Forest and Department of National Park, you know, as Nepal is preparing to uh, start uh, nationwide population assessment of the snow leopard you know and this project can be one of the important comp important component within that and so we are negotiating with government at the moment to receive their support 
so that uh, we follow common method in estimating small leopard population or in surveying small leopard. Uh, and, and we can lead uh, that target in uh, non-protected landscape in upper Karnali region where, where our project is focused. So also, uh, these are all the supporters that I need to thank all the time, my team and all these things. I think uh, that's all. So this is a very brief, I didn't present lots of data, you know, this is a very brief overview of what we are doing and what our work are focused on and how we are, uh, you know, how we are moving forward. So I would be happy to take questions if there are any, I think it would be most better if we make it more interactive. Uh, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Rindin, sir. Uh, it was indeed a very exciting presentation today. Uh, and congratu congratulations once again for the Rolex Award uh, from the entire team of SMCRF as well. Um, so everyone, if you have any questions, uh, you are free to drop them in the chat box. Uh, so meanwhile, uh, Rindin, sir, you talked about uh, your different projects that you, uh, you've you been carrying uh, carrying out since 2014 in the trans Himalayan region. Uh, so I wanted to ask that uh, how uh, how the people there uh, in that area perceive uh, the wildlife, especially snow leopard. Uh, I, I know that the project would not have been possible, would not have been success successful without the um, uh, cooperation of the local people. But I just wanted to ask what kind of difference did you find in locals' perception before you started the project and, uh, and, uh, and now? What, what, the, what is the difference uh, that you found? I think that's a very interesting question, you know, for like, as we were starting our work in Anupuna conservation area, the conservation was there, you know, already there, like, I think for more than two decades. So people there, they know about what conservation means. I mean, it's already a conservation area. But one interesting thing, what we observed was, you know, there was a big uh, differences in people's perception or attitude. There is a one set of the communities who are benefiting from tourism who are in the decision making process uh, who, who are more educated and, and they are always positive towards conservation. They believe, you know, everything has to protect either it's snow leopard or wolf or, or blue sheep or bird, it doesn't matter. You know, they, they, they believe conservation is something very important for tourism perspective, from tourism perspective. But there is also a communities, you know, which are least hard, who are more, uh, who are more dependent on herding. Uh, who are agro pastoralists or, or those who keep livestock, and their perception perception is different. They don't because they are not that benefiting from tourism. So, the, so one of the key livelihood they have is their livestock. And when they get frequent travel from snow leopard and wolves, you know, and, and they are the like they have a negative attitude and they don't really believe you know conserving these species really matters in the environment or for them. And and it was a big challenge. Uh, I think like a. I wouldn't say, you know, it can have been working there for more than two decades and it's still, it's still like the, either they or us, nobody is able to change their attitude. And this is one of the reasons because the conflict is never ending. So one of the good way to go is trying to mitigate this conflict and trying to hear the voices, you know, so that the harder feels uh, some positive hope. And that is how, and, and, and try to engage the uh, engagement in the conservation processes. And over the time, maybe we'll be able to change their attitude or change their perception towards wildlife. So this is the interesting thing. I think like a, it will continue, it will go on, you know, right now new hoarder and maybe like a, like he passed away, his son comes and hoard him. And even if he loves wildlife, when he's facing a recurring livestock loss from the predator, again, maybe like, you know, he have a different set of mindset and he became negative towards those animals. So it's the issue going on. Okay, uh, and you also talked about uh, several several interventions that you have been carrying out there uh, in the study area, and you were also talking about capacity building, where you uh, were taking uh, different members of the society for uh, like a walk outside and uh, teaching them about basic. Uh, uh, basic uh, wildlife uh, survey techniques uh, and uh, so actually how how are they exactly uh, like contributing to your research or uh, conservation in the area after you have given them uh, those uh, those kind of opportunities to learn from you 
Yeah, our long-term vision is you know, to train and to educate more of the local youths who are interested or who love, we have passion in environment conservation. It's not necessarily snow leopard, but overall environment. So we try to provide them basic training, but uh, you know, and we really want them to be the local steward or to be the ambassador, you know, and influence communities to be the what you call con uh, conservation ambassador or to bring change in conservation. And, and we are working on, you know, training more and more people, but uh, what exactly, how exactly is helping, it is quite difficult to say. For example, like school children, they are starting, they are not coming back, right? And yeah. there are also a big number of people that we have trained and they are not living there anymore. And, you know, the, the outward migration is one of the issue. But there are also very exciting hope, like Tasi Argale, you know, he's there, he has been leading this change for a decade. Uh, and he, he is a role model that we are trying to build. You know, and one of our focus is to try to train more people and try to produce more of Tasi Gale. Uh, and we are working on that direction. I think in Manang, like, uh, we have few people already doing, few students doing a very exciting job. Last time, one of the students was sending me a picture of a snow leopard uh, scarf. You know, he was there on a vacation and he saw a snow leopard calling. He was chasing it and had a very fresh picture. So these are some good signs. Uh, so we have one question from Mr. Laba Guragai. Uh, he asks, uh, what do you have to say on the ongoing pressure and increasing demand for tourism and development infrastructure by the private sector in the protected areas of Nepal, uh, especially in high mountain? Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, uh, what do you have to say about the ongoing pressure and increasing demand of tourism and development uh, infrastructure? by the private sector in the protected areas of Nepal, especially in high mountain? I think it's not just from private sector. More of the things are coming from the community. You know, there's the challenge. Everybody wants development. Everybody wants good road, good trails, right? So these are some of the uh, policy level issues that we cannot address. I think it's out of our scope, but uh, that is true. Uh, one of the main challenges in mountain, uh, biodiversity or mountain habitat conservation is the development which are going on in core areas, you know, uh, either is in Humla or Dolpo or Mustang, you know, the road is going through that. And, and this is a huge disturbance to wildlife. And pe as people's movement are increasing, there are lots of illegal things going on out. So this is something very uh, critical or uh, very important issues, but, uh, yeah, you know, but more linked to policy level. And on, unless we have the political commitment in this kind of things, it's, it's difficult from our side, yeah. Uh, and and so how uh, like how are you actually planning to like uh, reach out to the local government uh, to help you or cooperate with you uh, during your uh, during your project uh, in the area and uh, how are you actually planning to like uh, work together with them and uh, take conservation and development hand in hand uh, for now? Yes, that's the that's that's I think this is very relevant question and. I'm working in Humla, so most of my work is focused on Namkaruda municipality, and we have a very dynamic mayor there. You know, he's a very big fan of environment, and he's. Be, I think he has been very supportive to all the wildlife or other environment activity that is going on. And we are not working separately in Humla. Whatever we are doing, we are doing in collaboration with Namkaruda municipality. They are co-financing the conservation, and that was our, our ambition. You know, we we were. Uh, what you call when we're starting to work there, and we have been constantly working on that. Amir and I was sitting together and planning on how can we best integrate uh, local participation and your conservation work. And that was one of the concerns we have. So, rural municipalities co financing the conservation activities we are doing, and whatever the work we are doing, we are doing in collaboration with the rural municipality. Uh, you know, and, and all the uh, what you call ward chairman, it's called ward chairman, they are the one who are supporting us at the community level. And our work is not just focused on training local youths, but it is also focusing on uh, knowledge, awareness raising, uh, capacity building of the elected rural representative also, you know, unless the political leaders have ideas what we are trying to do, uh, you know, the changes may not be that quick. So engaging government itself in that process is what we are doing in Humla. Oh, that's great. That's 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 really great to hear. Uh, so we have another question from Mr. Tariq Ahmed Shah, and he says, uh, I have a basic question, like how can we differentiate between snow leopard individuals, as in case of tigers, stripes can be used to differ the individuals. 
So how yeah, can I you think... differ snow leopard, uh, differentiate snow leopard individuals? Thank you. Uh, so from the camera trap, when we, you, from the camera trap footage, we follow the same procedure as tiger. You know, we identify individual based on their body spot and tail, face and hands, you know, and but when we, uh, Apart from that, when we are doing the genetics, uh, is a different way, uh, you know, that, that that is identified from the DNA analysis. Uh, and, so, and, uh, and are you actually like uh, coloring, uh, G -G GPS uh, tagging those uh, snow leopards? Also, have you have you had any chance to capture snow leopards or you are just uh, like surveying uh, snow leopards with the help of camera traps only? No, we are not <laughs> radio coloring snow leopard. I think radio color Coloring is uh, out of our scope. I think uh, it's more of the government. You know, government is Hello. leading it by themselves. So we are not doing radio coloring. Uh, uh, yes, 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 Tariq, yeah. sir. Can I, can I speak? Uh, yes, sir, sure, sure. Yeah, sure, yeah. Sir. I just, I just uh, have some doubt. Uh, as Mr. Rinzen was uh, telling that they have the different spots. Like in tigers, we have the stripes. So is it the same way that the when we survey for the snow leopards are we are doing camera trapping or we are doing the normal surveys so so that these spots uh, are differ uh, differ uh, in the, all the individuals is it so yes Tarek Z, yes so what we do is you know when we are doing camera trapping we use two sets of camera not exactly like in case of tiger but alternative you know so that we try to capture both side of the same individual okay, and we front, identify front and the back side no what we do is we put it alternative you know when it's not about passing uh, so we we put inside that way the, our focus is to take the frontal section okay you know, portrait but sometimes uh, in many of the cases that is not practical because okay. high up in the mountain you know like there is no predefined tracks so snow leopard can use uh, either of one either they can come straight or they can go two steps something like that right so that is some of the challenge we have, and but we the our focus is always to take the portrait so that from the facial marking, you know, from the facial spot is more easier to identify the individual. If not, then we try to take the side picture and from the both the camera so that we have picture from two, two side, you know, from the left and right side, and then like uh, again identify it, you know, identify it thoroughly from their pattern. Yeah. So they don't use the trails like tigers do. Is it so? In many cases, in many cases, it's not leopard follow the normal trail that human follow or livestock follows. But in some of the cases, always not, you know, like uh, in many of the cases, uh, they don't come very straight, you know, in the direction that our camera are, or they move sideways or sometimes, you know, like they just cross in front of the camera. And that that is something, uh, that is some of the challenges that we have in uh, photographing this non leopard. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rinzin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tariq, sir. Uh, so here we have Mr. Vidyaman Thapa. He says, it was really nice to hear you, brother, and best wishes for the ongoing project. Yes. And here we have Mr. Bikram. He says, what are the technology uh, that you are using for snow leopard conservation? So far, the in in terms of technology, the only technology we are using is camera trapping. You know? But uh, this time, we are trying to use drone to monitor prey. Uh, apart from that, we are not using any other technology. Camera trapping is what we are mostly rely on. Uh, okay. So we have Prasid Gimire. He says, uh, do you plan to extend your snow leopard conservation project to other regions of Nepal too? Yeah, no, uh, not, not now. So we have, uh, we work in Annapurna conservation area and that was uh, one of the main field area where we are learning ourselves. There was more like a learning ground and trying some pilot project like uh, you know, conflict mitigation technique where the density of the snow leopard is high and it was easy. And then we have different area in Annapurna conservation area to compare the effectiveness. Uh, but right now in Annapurna, we only have the monitoring program. So most of our project will be focused in Western Nepal uh, in the non-protected landscape. Uh, it will go from Mugu on the area outside the safe folks in the area until Humla. Yeah, that that will be what we will be focusing on the future in the future. Okay, uh, so Arindin sir, you were also talking about the pilot projects that you've been carrying out regarding different uh, technologies, like uh, different uh, interventions, uh, such as use, uh, such as keeping the cattle inside uh, very high cages and using fox lights to uh, 
uh, to chase away uh, the the predators. So mm -hmm. uh, you've been uh, trying this since 2008, 2018, I suppose, and uh, you you 15. have yes, 2016, and you you are and you are still ongoing. So till now, how what have you observed? Uh, like these uh, steps, like these uh, strategies are uh, seem uh, do these strategies seem to be working, or uh, how how do you how do you see that? It's variable, you know. It's variable. I think we, uh, I think the the area we are trying to publish our, our first paper out of this uh, is under review now. But we have some exciting result. Uh, in case of uh, yeah, it's really working out. In case of small stock, uh, this is also effective. The only issue is uh, the seasonal. There is a seasonal variation. The coral are uh, not mobile. They are fixed, const fixedly constructed. For example, we have coral in one area, a livestock are there for three months, and then they move out. And uh, in other area, we don't have coral, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and the perception of hoarders are also variable. Some hoarders believe it's very effective. Some says it's not very effective. But our pilot assessment from 2014 until now, uh, you know, it has been quite effective. And there are lots of things. It's not just about uh, coral and fox light. We are also uh, piloting lots of other things. For example, uh, some of the harder they bond dung, you know, cattle dung close to the harder set and throw out the smoke. And all of these activities are to make human presence, uh, to let the predator feel that there's a human and we should avoid those area. You know, these are some of the different things in a small scale, not in a very large scale. Uh, most of our experiment, like, you know, all these things are based on uh, Manang and Upper Mustang. Uh, and so far, the result is exciting, and we hope to share our findings soon. Okay, sure. And uh, and ha have you heard about anything about human casualties uh, uh, instead of, like, uh, apart from livestock depredation from due to snow there's leopards? No, there's no human casualties. I think those people should be lucky <laughs> Who have a privilege to snow leopard close by, right? It's hard to see snow leopard as, as you know, they are so good with smell. As soon as they smell human, they run away. So I think, like uh, in Nepal, Himalaya, no cases, no way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mr. Tari Kaimad, he says, Thanks for the beautiful talk. Uh, good luck and best wishes. Uh, yes, so, you. I think we are actually at the end of the, we are coming to the end of the program. So, before that, uh, I just wanted to ask that uh, how did you like happen to apply for Rolex Award and, uh, you, and you became the first person, first person from Nepal to receive the Rolex Award? Uh, how, how did you, how did you happen to like uh, go for this? Can you actually like, so I I think this should be this should be a good sharing for everyone who, who wants to apply for i think rolex is free to apply anybody can apply we have a plan to do work. you know rolex provides awards to not to the past project but it applies uh, you know they are providing the award to the project that has been planned and is uh, going to implement for example like ours so uh, i i i was aware about the rolex uh, award a long time back you know my mentor dr Rodney jackson was uh, one of the Rolex award, we got the award in 1978, 78, yes, for starting Snow Leopard in Nepal. And then that was the first time he was starting uh, Snow Leopard home range and all this ecology using radio coloring. Uh, and I was aware about that, but uh, and during the, I, before the lockdown, uh, I was coming back from Germany. I was in quarantine in my home. And that time I saw the application, uh, you know, the Rolex application. And I just wrote a concept note and submitted them. They accepted it and they called for the full proposal. And it took me one month to write down the full proposal and it went on. So the process is uh, quite simple, but it's very time consuming process. They take quite lots of, uh, you know, it does, it's quite time consuming. And as soon as I submit the proposal after three or four months, I was invited for the first interview. And then again, I was in, invited for the second interview. And then uh, I was shortlisted for the final interview, uh, which was in November. So I submitted the application in May. Uh, and then the, the full proposal, project proposal in June. And then the final interview was in November. And after the interview, like, you know, it was like that. So I was, start, I was doing survey in Upper Mustang and in June 2000, uh, 21. Uh, the application was in 2020, and the final result was in June 23, 2021. So basically, it's almost one year time. 
one year time period. So the application process is quite easy. I think like everybody uh, uh, who are interested, who have a, a plan, a project plan, uh, who wants to do something. Hello. Vanessa? They are free to apply uh, if uh, if I can hear me. Uh, yes, yes, I, I can hear it. We can hear it now. Uh, so thank you so much, Rinjin, sir. Uh, that was quite amazing to hear from you. Uh, so Mr. Tariq Ahmed is also like asking uh, for your WhatsApp number. If it's appropriate, you can, you, know, you can, you can like talk to him. Mr. Tariq sure. Ahmed is like, uh, he has message, message here in the chat box. Uh, so if everyone, uh, if uh, the questions, if you have any more questions, we can have few more. Uh, so we have uh, Raj, Mr. Rajan Prasad. He says, congratulations on your achievement and best wishes. Can you share a bit on snow leopard interaction with other small mam other, sm other mammals and also on the current evidence on prey-based decline and disease? I think you can also see the questions in the chat box. Yeah. So about the interaction, you know, uh, this is also very interesting. In case of Manang, where the wildlife diversity is very high, there is regular interaction. So it's just a matter of time, maybe like a five minutes uh, before five minutes, there is a red fox coming in front of the camera. And right after five minutes, uh, there is a Martin coming. And after maybe like a five, 10 minutes, it's not leopard is coming. There is, a, you know, these are some of the direct interaction that we can see, but more detail on about the wildlife interaction in relation to the habitat use in relation to the time timeline you know we are i think uh, we are working on the manuscript uh, at present you know we have already analyzed so uh, maybe we hope to share the paper out soon uh, but there is a interaction there is a very interesting interaction in case of manak and about the evidence of prey decline about the prey decline is hard to say in humla definitely there is a prey decline uh, because it is one of the reason is subsistence hunting uh, uh, but apart from that, the uh, one of the issue with wildlife disease, wildlife disease has been a problem now. In Upper Mustang, there was a disease, you know, like foot and mouth disease was there on blue sheep, and the other was what you call like uh, the blindness disease. And more recently, we photographed some blue sheep uh, with the skin disease on. You know, we sent that photo to NTNC to identify what disease is there, but I haven't got back the response. But there are diseases because of these diseases. Uh, blue sheep number is uh, going down, you know, it's not in a very sharp rate, but somehow it's affecting uh, the po overall population composition. But uh, we don't have very, uh, what you call like solid scientific evidence on this to claim. Uh, that is why we, we are focusing on, you know, the wildlife disease needs more studies, more research in this dimension. Versus, do you hear me? I think that's all, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yes, Rindin, sir, I can hear you. So over here, Mr. Bikram is saying that he's a big fan of you <laughs> from Morang <laughs> and want to do some research with you if possible. So uh, Thank you, with this, so, so I just wanted to uh, ask you if if anybody here uh, present today in this session, if anyone wants to collaborate with you or wants to get in touch with you, how can they do so? If uh, you can give anything like your contact think, details, or you can yeah, share contact the, details with them. With them. Yeah, one of the easy ways is to follow either on Facebook. Instagram is more commonly what we use, right? Uh, we are launching our project website very soon. Uh, like if there is any opportunity that if we could provide then people can you know like write me directly by that but uh, as you say is uh, right now we don't have, you know we don't have that plan so we'll see in the future. okay okay so so thank you so much Rinjin sir for having your time today it was really a pleasure to host you today and uh, learn from you a lot uh, and uh, so with that we are at the end of our session today so uh, for this, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Naresh Kusi uh, for his concluding remarks here. Um, Mr. Nare Naresh Kusi is the country program director for Himalayan Wolves Project, and he's a wildlife biologist and an explorer uh, with special affinity towards the carnivores of the Himalayas and is keen towards finding appropriate ways to ensure an effective coexistence between wild carnivores and people in the Himalayas. And uh, Mr. Kusi and his team uh, have rediscovered the wild yak for Nepal after decades of, his, uh, of its assumed local extinction. So 
congratulating Mr. Nareesh Kusi. I would like to invite him here for his concluding remarks. So Mr. Nareesh Kusi, over to you. Well, thank you, Barsa. You hear me right? Uh, yes, no, no, Mr. Kusi, we, we are hearing you. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Ranjin. It's a great honor for our country to be awarded with the Rolex Award. And I'm very sure that we are going to have some incredible outputs from the project. So, yeah, what I'm very happy in particular about is that uh, we are seeing the rise of more local leaders from the communities itself, because often we see that some people who dwell from Kathmandu or some other these sophisticated places, when they go to the Himalayas or in these difficult terrains, these are mostly short-lived, you know. They have uh, fancy or excitement for some short period of time, and it is very, very difficult oftentimes to see these people committed to continue long-term. And it's really important that we have people like Rinjin, and Tashidai or some people like Chiring from Dolpa who are actually hailing from the local areas because the stewardship of community and the commitment to work for the conservation of wildlife in the area can be strong only if people like Rinjin and others who I mentioned take the lead. So I hope and I believe that we will continue to have more people coming out from these places. Like we have some other people like Bidyaman from Humla, then we have Tenjin and other new people who are aspiring to become committed to work for conservation. And yeah, as mentioned uh, in Humla and in other places of the country as well, more explorations and more scientific researches have brought out many new findings and this is indeed very important for a country like us where wildlife research is still uh, in very initial phases. We are still doing kind of works like that and do update. So Rinjin mentioned about the palace cat discovery in uh, Manang, then there is this rediscovery of wild yak from Humla RSS where people did not have a proper knowledge before uh, local people and dedicated wildlife biologists came out to do their research. So my personal uh, hope is that with more researches, we will be able to dig out more secrets that lie hidden in the nook and corners of the Himalayas because they are very remote. And obviously for that, the most important thing is we spend more time in field because we often see people making big fuss in social media and others, but actually in the field, they spend very less time. And in such a way, when you work, oftentimes it's very difficult to come up with good findings. So spending time in field, and I have seen Rinjin, I've seen other people, I mean, Tasidai and others, they have been spending really significant time in field. And that is what counts to come up with uh, beautiful findings. And as you mentioned, uh, it's also good to hear that he has this uh, plan of working in these new places, including the Karmarung Valley in Mu, because uh, to be able to come up with some robust suggestions for conservation plannings, we need to have landscape level data. But covering large area landscape wise is very important. And yeah, as I said already, this project will definitely come up with many important uh, findings and suggestions that can be useful for the government and for the local authorities as well. And it's a big pleasure for me to also mention that Rinjin and I, we will be uh, doing some collaborative work in Aparamla because both our uh, projects are there and we must do the same kind of work and our aspiration from the projects are same. We want to empower the communities and we want to ensure that in the long term, the communities themselves become able to protect the animals by getting their own resources so that they do not have to always rely on external funds like these awards and grants and everything. And as Rinjin mentioned, 
there are incredible local level leaders and people who have been very, very supportive uh, in all our endeavors that we have been doing. So yeah, mm, I hope that many people uh, will still aspire to become biologists like Rinjin. And as I said, commitment was needed. It should not be a short term fancy or we want some related people who work in the field to sustain the research and to come up with incredible findings. And there is one very uh, interesting, um, what do you say, quote by Dr. George Saller. He says that victories are never attained in conservation. It's a fight forevermore. There is nothing like victory in conservation. Hello, Mr. Kusi. Mr. Kusi, are you hearing us? Uh, so I think Mr. Kusi was uh, coming to the end of his concluding remarks, maybe. And uh, so I think we have now actually come to the end of the of today's session. And Carl, thank you, Mr. Uh, once again, uh, Mr. Lama, for your uh, for having your time, and congratulations once again. And uh, Thank you, Mr. Naresh Kusi, for having your time as well, for giving your concluding remarks as well. And we would also like to uh, give you best wishes, both of you, Mr. Rinzin Lama and Mr. Naresh Kusi, for your upcoming endeavors, for your full future collaborations. And we would like, we, we, we would definitely like to see you working together and uh, inspiring like younger generations to like or to work like you, like Naresh, Mr. Naresh Kusi said. And uh, so thank you. This is the end for today's session. Uh, so thank you so much, Mr. Rinzin. And thank you so much, everyone who, uh, who joined us today for this session. And at the end, happy Dasai and Tihar as well, because Dasai and Tihar is approaching. And we will likely see you all after Dasai, Dasai and Tihar for the next episode of Wild and Life Seminar Series. So till then, uh, thank you and see you all. Thank you so much, Mr. Rinzin, for your time. Bye-bye.